One of the most impressive things about this event, one of the most impressive things for me is that on day two, if you look around this room, look how many people are here for day two. This is impressive. And so more than anything else, what this tells me is that you're serious about this, that there's enough movement in Pittsburgh that we want to do something. So thank you for showing up. Again, I'm Jamil Bay with the Urban Kind Institute, and as it has already been referenced today, uh, last year, about 50 or so of us went to Los Angeles to the Policy Link Summit. And it was a result of the energy that was created from the P4 when Angela Blackwell Glover did her uh, piece there. It inspired us to go take a look at what was happening at that summit. Uh, more than 2,000 people attended that summit. It was a tremendous experience for most of us. And when we returned, we were inspired to do something. We needed, we needed implementation. We needed a way forward. We needed to think about how. And as every one of you has thought at some point, we don't need another darn report. Okay? We, we, we don't need another report talking about what the problem is. But what we did need was an action agenda. We need a path forward. So we, we didn't want to call it a report to throw in the pile of here's another report. So this is an action agenda for Pittsburgh. And so what we did, we kept in contact with the people who went to Policy Link. We had a couple of follow-up meetings with that entire group. Uh, we then instituted a series of video uh, conversations where we hosted them from our offices and we broadcast them across YouTube. We invited six or, we had six people per panel and we went through a list of topics that Policy Link suggested were important if Pittsburgh was gonna be an all-in city. And so these were t topics like accessible jobs that provide family sustainable wages. We all, I mean, that's come up today, it's come up yesterday. We agree that that's something that's important. So we had a conversation around that uh, economic security and mobility for vulnerable families and workers, nurturing homegrown talent through a strong cradle to career pipeline, healthy, opportunity rich neighborhoods for all, resilient, connected infrastructure, access to high quality, affordable homes with strong anti displacement strategies and policies, uh, and attempts to expand the democracy and the right to the city, and justice in our policing and court systems. And so we had those eight conversations. Uh, they're still available on YouTube to take a look at the conversations. And we took uh, notes from the twi Twitter feed and the YouTube comments. We summarized those. We then had individual interviews with a lot of the people. So actual people that we touched, not in the Donald Trump kind of way, but people who we touched in our outreach for this report, we probably close to 300 people had some piece that they put into this, this. And so what we came out with a list of over 28 recommendations for getting at these strategies. And even in the recommendations, there were some themes that emerged. One of those themes is that this is a long-term battle. This is not something that we're going to do. And there's no switch that we're going to flick and say, okay, we have equity in Pittsburgh. And I don't typically like reading the folks, but there's this one paragraph that, that really stood out that I want to make sure I capture what, we, what, we said, what was said here. That there is a deep sense among participants that this is an uphill battle with long odds and limited resources. Pittsburgh's African-American and much smaller Latino and recent refugee popula populations have insufficient vested political, social, cultural, or economic capital to affect an equity agenda. The fight requires that these populations to identify allies with connections who view equity as both process and goal. The participants in this study recognize that the fight for justice and equity is a long-term commitment. However, a long-term battle does not favor African Americans in Pittsburgh. Young African American pre-professionals, those with new college degrees, represent the demographic that is most likely to leave Pittsburgh. And that came up yesterday uh, in Dr. Wallace's report. And it, it reminds me of, of the, the introduction to Public Enemy's song, Fight the Power. You know, some of our best trained, best educated refuse to fight. 
So they leave Pittsburgh, and we're left with a deeper hole to fill. And so that's something that, we're, we're, that came in that report. The report's available. There's a link to it on your app. It's on the P4 website. Uh, I'm recommending that you take a look at it. Another theme that went across these themes, that Pittsburgh, this is going to require bold leadership. You know, and we see leaders emerging. And leadership, you know, this is not necessarily elected officials. But, you know, we need leadership across the board in all of our aspects to take this agenda and drive it. Uh, another theme was communication, and this covered a couple of things. We don't have adequate language to talk about this equity agenda. Uh, in one conversation with a council person, uh, the conversation went that we would love to talk about affordable housing. We get it, we understand it, but we don't have that language because if I talked about that in my, with my constituency, that means, oh my goodness, you're trying to put poor black people in Section 8 next to me. And Though the council person was understood it, and I consider this council person an ally, I understood where they were coming from. You know, this is an elected official who depends on people voting for uh, to, to maintain office. And so we need to work on that. How do we make that conversation so that people do get it? And where we get past these buzzwords and we get past people who oppose these things on whatever grounds, They've done a much better job on, with negative language and negative association with some of these things. Uh, the anchors are not present to the same degree that they are in some other cities. And so while the, our anchors definitely drive the economy, as far as their commitment to an equity agenda and their, per, per, their place in these conversations, they've not gone all in yet. Uh, the corporate leaders are missing. Uh, and the other thing is, race is a difficult conversation to have. And it makes people uncomfortable. There are a lot of folks who feel like, well, I'm a good person. I, I didn't do it. Why, why do, and they get defensive when the topic is brought up. We have to have, and this is where leadership comes in. This is where the messaging comes in. We have to have these conversations to get past that. Because as we've had today, the problem is not, it's not a black problem. Genera was right. This is a Pittsburgh problem, and we have to embrace it in that bigger picture and, and think about how to do that. And a third one that came up, came up was there's no need to reinvent the wheel. We see with all the reports that we have, and we, set, we see what's happening in other cities, there's a lot of best practices that we can take up. Okay, so before we get into the, the, the action part, some of the challenges Number one was our history, and it, it seems obvious once you state it, but it's not like there's a restore point where we can go and say, okay, this is what we're trying to get to. We've never had it right. The history of Pittsburgh, the history in this country with race relations was never a good history that we can say this is what we're trying to do. Um, and so it, we also have very few precedents across the country where any city has really gotten it right. There are some cities that are doing better, but you know, we still need to think about what this is going to look like or a completely new future. A second challenge was that there is very little diversity in Pittsburgh's population. This makes it difficult for coalition building. Um, when we were in PolicyLink, a lot of people co commented at that summit that in other cities, they saw broad coalitions working toward this. And so there were people who were fighting for uh, green infrastructure and people who are fighting for re recycling programs on the same side as native populations fighting for to be included. That they understood that the, that coalition is what can drive an agenda and we need to think about what that looks like in Pittsburgh. Our neighborhoods are isolated and we talked about this earlier today, the fragmentation. We don't have this history of cooperating across neighborhood boundaries and we need to rethink whether that is an adequate way of dividing and approaching our problems. Okay, so now, now it's time to get to work. So yesterday I challenged you to do three things. Take it personally. It's up to you to be the leader. It's up to you to drive this agenda. Call foul, and someone asked me later with my, I guess in my Pittsburgh accent, they couldn't determine what that word was. Call a foul, F-O-U-L. It's, I wanted to say B-S, but Rob told me not to swear in public. Uh, and so, when you see it, call it out. 
we, ha we have to take responsibility. Make it, it's not cool to continue to do these things that keep getting us the same result. We know that. And the last one is to commit to a transformative, a transformational agenda. Get rid of the thinking that led, led us to, well, that's the way we always did it. Th that's why we're in this problem. We have to do things differently. Okay, so let's get to work. So what we're going to do at these tables is we're going to go to these questions that we had yesterday, okay? Or the, the questions that came up in the earlier session. So to help you get focused, at your tables, I want you to talk about this question here. Talk amongst yourselves. Get to this. There are folks who are on our team in each section who are going to be listening in on your conversations. They're going to be taking some notes, and they're going to do the report out. This is a, not a, a large number of people to do this sort of interactive thing, but we're going to do the best that we can. Uh, so make sure that this is question number one. I'm going to give you 10 minutes to talk about this, okay? Why, why did you select this breakout topic? Why is it important to you? Okay, so if you remember what the topics were, if you're in section A, you're talking about raising the bar of development. Section B is making all neighborhoods healthy communities of opportunity. Number three are expanding employment and ownership opportunities. That's section C. Section four, embedding racial equity throughout Pittsburgh's institutions and businesses. And section F uh, E in the back corner, Build community, power, voice, and capacity. Why did you select the topic that you did? Why is this important to you? All right, I'll check back in with you in 10 minutes. Okay, so we, we have a sense now of what it is that brought you to that table and why that topic resonates with you. So you should be familiar enough with the folks at your table to take us to the next level now, right? So our, our second question that we want you to dig into, okay? What critical change has to happen to make this a reality? Okay, we talked before, there's not gonna be a magic switch that we can flick. We have to make some serious changes and each of you brings a different perspective to what, what is necessary. So we, we need to capture as much of that as we can, okay? So what critical change has to happen to make this a reality? All right, I'm gonna give you another 10 minutes to wrestle with that one. There are some really rich conversations going on out there. Okay, we understand now the changes that we need to embrace in order to make this reality, but for the sake of time and effort, we're gonna to have to move on. Our final question, okay? What can you do? This is the question you've all been waiting for. What is it that you and your organization can contribute to advance equitable development in Pittsburgh? Is about this, this now what question. We've heard people talking about, you know, we've had these meetings. What's the implementation look like? Well, that, that's been a part of our thinking prior to this event. And so one of the things that on your, there's a, a handout, equitable development, the path to all in Pittsburgh, at the bottom of that, uh, read the full report, and then there's Shad Henderson's email address. Does everyone know Shad at Neighborhood Allies? Yeah. Shad, can you raise your, raise your hand so they can put a face with it straight back here? Okay, well, Shad is coordinating. You know, we're gonna continue this conversation with a lot of partners, people who already said that they wanna be a part of what's next, what this implementation looks like. If you can send Shad an email that just says, Shad, I'm in, add me to the list. And, or if you wanna send Shad an email with some additional thoughts, because these conversations are, all, all, are ongoing and we have no mechanism for capturing 400 people's input right now. So if you wanna send Shad at neighborhoodallies.org, S-H-A-D, an email that says, I'm in, that's fine. If you want to send him some other ideas that you have on any of these questions, that's fine. So we're going to start with our report out. And we're going to go to uh, Tracy Ross from Neighborhood Allies. I really can't see much. She's somewhere in that back corner. Oh, she's over here. Tracy. And I'm, I'm actually from Policy Link. Tracy, <laughs> you're right. Tracy from Policy Link. I knew that. Tracy from Policy Link is going to help us 
Tracy, what were you hearing? Why is this topic important to folks? So I was a part of Group E, which is the Community Voices um, part, talking about community engagement, capacity building. And I think across all of the tables here, we found that the other issue areas aren't possible until we've gotten this area down, that until we truly understand what people want and what people need, that the other work that needs to be done can't happen. So some of the, the key things, themes that emerged from the, the several tables we have here is that community voices are important for buy-in. If you don't have buy-in, you won't actually be able to implement the strategies you have, and therefore you won't see true transformation. Um, another point that was made was that a lot of initiatives will address symptoms, whereas if you actually understand what people are experiencing in these communities, you'll get to the more of the systemic uh, issues at, at hand. Um, there was also some talk about how the government can be uneasy in doing community engagement because it reveals, again, that some of the strategies are addressing symptoms rather than systemic issues, so that the work is a lot more um, difficult than a lot of leaders might acknowledge. Um, one important point that was raised many times was that community members already have a voice, so it's not about um, giving them uh, a voice, they have it, it's that we have to understand how to listen. We need to understand how to break down structural barriers to ensure that their voice is actually part of the process. Um, and, and a great way that this was summed up was that Reverend Tim Smith that um, said that he goes to the University of Hazelwood and he's gonna continue to be a student of the university. I like that. So it sounds, I, I've never considered this. I, I've written and I've talked about uh, residents and people being threatened by development and being victims of development, it sounds like that if we're not careful in bringing that community voice to the process, then people can be threatened by equity. We can't impose equity on the folks. We have to include folks into that conversation uh, to be a part of that. Thank you, Tracy Ross from PolicyLink. Thank you. All right, next we're gonna to go to the back corner. Shad Henderson from Neighborhood Allies uh, is gonna to talk to us. What critical changes must occur to make this a reality, Shad? What are you hearing? Thank you, Dr. Bay. A uh, couple things we heard is that anchors, we, we've heard it multiple times, but it was reiterated that they need to be more involved and maybe even start uh, investing directly into our neighborhoods. In neighborhoods like Homewood, Hazelwood, what is that direct connection? Um, we also talked about the education partners are missing from this conversation. Where's Pittsburgh Public Schools, the superintendent? Um, they really need to be more involved and there needs to be more intersectionality with uh, community development. Um, the other thing we talked about was a need for collective impact. Um, we all know we don't need a, another report and we're all hungry for implementation, but what does that look like where we all combine uh, our efforts, a shared agenda? Uh, that was something that was mentioned in uh, all of the tables that I was a part of. Um, one of the other things that was talked about was Jamil, when you talked about calling foul, um, and that is just not uh, a problem of the African American community, um, but when white people are in meetings, um, we talked about them sharing that emotional burden too. It shouldn't just be the burden of African Americans in the private sector. Um, I talked about my experience where I worked in an organization where I was the only black person there, so, but my voice wasn't included. It's just, it's more than just having black people on your staff, but how are you ensuring that their voice is heard and represented and respected? So, in a nutshell, that was it. Thank you, Shad Henderson, Neighborhood Allies. Uh, to the same question, uh, in group, what is this, group C, Talia Piazza, also from Neighborhood Allies. Talia, what critical changes must occur to make this a reality? 
Thanks, Jamil. Um, what we heard was really about we need to rebuild the system. Um, there's a lot of separate components that are working well, but nothing is seamlessly going through um, a path to create real success and opportunity. Um, specifically, people talked about changing job requirements to base it off of compet competency and to be realistic about qualifications that people put into job descriptions. Um, employers need to invest in on-the-job training and position their employees to be successful and to grow and to be the type of um, employees and owners that they want and need. Um, we need to create culturally appropriate on-ramps for entrepreneurs, um, provide technical assistance and set aside resources for people to be able to complete successful applications for grants and loans so they can access the resources they need to be successful. Um, we also talked about investing in and focusing on young people and the, the new generation and making sure they're positioned to be successful um, so that all of this is already happening, that we don't have to put in the time and the energy that they're positioned to be successful um, and be the entrepreneurs and the workers that they can and should be. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you. So this last question, we're going to get to the first the group A and group B. Um, I think it was difficult for people to get into because you could sort of get that sense, you have to take ownership now. When you start talking about what it is that you can do in your organization, and people are afraid. They said, this is a tough conversation, and I'm glad that you did participate. And as I was walking around, the facilitators were saying, well, they're not talking about it. They're not answering it. They're not answering it. But eventually, you got to it. So we're going to go to Colleen Kane uh, over here. Uh, she's with the Urban Kind Institute. Colleen, what, what were you hearing? What can you and your organization contribute to advance equitable development in Pittsburgh? OK, so our group B had a lot of different organizations, a variety of sectors, I would say. Um, we had people from the nonprofit sector. We're having trouble here. Oh, sorry. People from the nonprofit sector, um, national, service-based, uh, location-based, like CDCs. Uh, we had folks from the private sector, like architects, especially engineers, um, people from academia, and also local government um, and local financial institutions. And we also had some local coalitions and collaborations. So I think that the answers we got were pretty varied and I was trying to find some common themes. So what I found was um, I heard a lot of organizing or utilizing volunteers, especially in the context of a community garden. Um, I heard push to enforce policies. I suppose that was at all levels. Um, hold officials accountable, uh, hold officials up to transparency. Um, I also heard um, building capacity in a couple of different ways, um, increasing the presence of different perspectives or my more diverse per perspectives on boards um, as coworkers, people you hire. Um, also heard of building capacity in terms of workforce development, in terms of parent engagement, and also uh, training people to get federal grants. I heard at one of the tables. A um, few other things, develop land trusts, or I guess aid uh, organizations in developing land trusts, or the city. Um, paying attention and supporting each other, um, building coalitions, having a united front. Um, and lastly, uh, there was some talk about design standards, uh, raising the bar, and listening to communities. Thank you, Dr. King. All right, and our last group up front, uh, Taylor Clem, also with the Urban Kind Institute. Taylor, yeah. what were you hearing? What can you and your organization contribute to advance equitable development in Pittsburgh? So similar to what Colleen said, um, a lot of the a lot of people were saying that organizations are already have something in place, so they were telling what they contributed. So um, we kind of summarize that as keeping equity at the forefront of everything um, that they do in day-to-day -day advocacy. One other thing that they mentioned was uh, P4 tr metrics, and everyone needs something to hold people accountable for, and they use the P4 metric at four metrics as an example. Um, 
They also said to, we can convene discussions and to not be afraid to uh, say we need help and to bring in outside knowledge, but with that outside knowledge to uh, integrate them into what's going on um, and really including them in the conversation so they're not, um, they're not just inserting their opinion without knowing what's already here. We also, they also talked a lot about uh, we have to talk about the positives. Uh, we do a lot about talk about what we don't want and not talk, or talking about what we don't have or what we don't want and not talking about what we do have and how we can elevate that. Diverse staff was one of them to ensure that we are uh, diversifying our staff and to ensure people on the staff is on the same page. And, um, and to really call foul or BS like you mentioned um, on, the, on the team. Uh, one thing is just, again, push political reps on equity agenda and to really, uh, in, inside each organization, make sh making sure that they're doing that individually. How can we push this uh, um, agenda, just day-to-day -day advocacy? And, and also to, to just continue to do what you're doing and don't always wait for policy change. Um, what can we do? What can we build on that we already have while we are waiting for this policy uh, to change and pushing that? So that was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. So we had a rich conversation at the tables, as you can see, and there's a lot happening. There's a lot more that can happen, a lot more that should happen. It doesn't stop here. We have to keep on this. We all recognize that this is a long-term fight but we have to fight, okay? We have to make it happen. Continue to take it personally, call file, and commit to a transform transformation agenda. Okay, uh, somehow we actually finished up about five minutes early. Don't, don't, don't jump up yet. So uh, this is a good thing. So your bathroom break, lunch is at noon. I don't know if they're ready yet, um, but we're gonna come back here at one o'clock to define that just Pittsburgh and have that conversation. All right, thank you for a, a, a tremendous morning.